Hello. Hello, everyone. This is Maureen Fitzgerald from City Match, and we are on the home stretch of the 2017 training course in MCH epidemiology with a great final training session today. On behalf of the CDC Division of Reproductive Health, HRSA's Maternal and Child Health Bureau, and City Match, welcome. Today's webinar offers an overview on using trend data and is presented by Dr. Deborah Rosenberg, who truly needs no introduction. However, her biosketch was included with your registration materials. You're all pros at this by now, but for the sake of refreshing everyone's memory, we'll walk through the housekeeping and webinar process just to make sure this last one goes smoothly. First of all, audio portion. The webinar um, begins with everyone's phone lines muted. So everyone right now, your phone lines are muted. And if you need to unmute your phone to ask a question, and uh, I've talked to Deb and she encourages you if she's presenting and you have a question that you would like to ask, she has no problem with a really interactive call. Um, so feel free, if you want to ask a question, press star seven and uh, go ahead and ask your question or have your conversation. And when you're done speaking, press star six to remute. So that's star seven to be able to speak, star six to remute your line. And then at some point or toward the end, if Deb requests that I unmute all the lines for open conversation, um, we'll give you a heads up a, a few seconds in order to quiet your offices or conference rooms wherever you're taking the call. Second, um, chat box. At the bottom left, there's a chat box feature where you can type in a question um, and you can select who you want to direct it to, um, if it's to the entire group or to me or Deb. I'll monitor that um, to the best of my ability and share those with Deb. Again, I encourage you to use the star seven and ask a question in the moment if that works best. However, if you have any technical difficulties, send those via me, um, via the chat box to me so we don't interrupt Deb and I can just manage it from there. Third, and this one uh, you know is really important, don't put your phone on hold. If you have to step out, leave your phone muted or just disconnect and call back in. Finally, connections, if you're unexpectedly disconnected via the web or phone, just redial, log in, rejoin. It's, it's not a big deal. So that's it for housekeeping. At this time, I welcome Dr. Deborah Rosenberg to open her webinar. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Deb Rosenberg, and I'm sort of in a new role here. I used to be one of the the lead faculty in the face-to-face -face training, and I stopped doing that a couple of years ago, but I'm really pleased to be with you at least virtually for this webinar. Um, so we are going to talk about trend analysis today, and as Maureen said, I really, really, I mean, I'm not just saying it. If you want to either ask a question or make a comment or whatever, please feel free to do so. I'll also try and stop every once in a while to see if there's questions, but um, I really like it when it's not just me talking for 90 minutes. Um, so here is, in general, what we're going to cover today. I'm going to do a brief overview of just ideas and challenges and opportunities for analyzing trend data. And then specifically, I'm going to talk about trend data for setting targets and um, monitoring progress towards objectives, and then trend data for program evaluation and for quality improvement. And then I have a, some nice examples and some short discussion about some special regression techniques um, for, for doing trend analysis. And then a long example that I love that I update every year about infant mortality in Dane County Wisconsin, and if there's time, but I, I honestly I never know. Um, I can actually I don't know. We'll find, we'll see how many of you have actually used JoinPoint before. But if we have time, I can actually do uh, an example in real time um, at the end if there's time. Okay, let's get started. So just in terms of the overview, things that we have to think about when we're going to be summarizing data by time. And 
I purposely say, rather than just saying trend analysis, which is obviously what we're doing, summarizing data by time, because really this is not so different a process than summarizing data other ways, which we are always doing, whether we're summarizing data in epi terms by person, you know, person place or time, um, summarizing data by geography. I mean, it's everything we do in terms of statistical and epidemiologic approaches is all about summarizing data. In this case, it's just what are some of the ways we have to think about that summarization process when, it's, when we're looking at data over time. Um, so we have to think about independence of observations. Obviously, independence is kind of one of the, uh, the foundational points of any statistical analysis. We need to think about smoothing techniques. We have to talk about what is the time frame, that is, you know, from when to when, and what is the sample size and the meaning of sample size when we're talking about trend analysis, and then thinking about confidence intervals, and now in the world of trend analysis, also confidence bands. One thing to keep in mind is that typically trend analysis has been used over long historical periods. And the most common one and relevant to our field, of course, is infant mortality, where we're looking really, you know, the whole 20th century, whatever. We're looking at a really long time trend. The issue becomes, though, that more and more we're interested in analyzing trends in either shorter time frames, smaller population groups, so not the whole population, of it, not infant mortality in the U.S. or infant mortality in the world, but maybe infant mortality in a county. Um, so smaller geographic areas, smaller, therefore smaller population size, shorter time frames, and what does that mean for then how we analyze trend data? And we have different purposes for doing the trend analysis as well. The most common is obviously just a surveillance approach of looking at the general pattern of change over time, you know, whether is something increasing or dis decreasing, whether it's health outcomes, whether it's health services, something else about systems. Um, and then we might also be comparing one time period to another time period, that's more in the arena of program evaluation, um, or it might just be something about we think there's a secular trend going on, and there's a, an idea of a before and an after, so that's a, a different purpose. We might be comparing trends across geographic areas which adds richness to the way we can compare those two geographic areas because, you know, if we, if we just look at the um, cross-sectional look of just last year or the last two years combined or something, you know, one area could look better than another and lo and behold, if we look back 10 years, that who's above and who's below in terms of the geographic area may be changing over time. And that's a, really important for us to understand and to interpret why, why is that happening. Um, say, similarly, we might be comparing um, two or more population subgroups and the same kind of thing occurs that when we just look cross-sectionally at the difference between one group and another uh, we may see one thing, whereas when we look at a whole, uh, uh, a whole set of data points over time, it really might change the way we see disparities and differences across groups. And uh, part of that is also making projections. So if we want to project um, into the future, what do we think is going to happen next year or five years from now or ten years from now? We obviously can't really do that with one data point, and we, we want to do that with, with a longer series of data. 
When trend data is based on small numbers, obviously the stability, or really should I say the instability of the rates, has to be taken into account. And again, this, this really matters when we're trying to do kind of combining trend analysis with small area analysis, where our sample size is getting, getting you know, much tinier. Um, what about also when the time period itself is short? In a way, that's also a sample size issue, right? Because now we have both sample size meaning the individuals who make up a rate or a proportion that we're analyzing over time, how many individuals are included in that proportion, of course, is important. But then there's the sample size across time at all. Are we only analyzing three points of data, five points of data, 10 time points, 50 time points? That's a different sort of sample size but equally important now in thinking about the reliability of what we're, what we're looking at. And that, that kind of sample size really makes a difference when, when we want to use the trend data to make projections. Um, same kind of analytic issues are involved with trend analysis as with any other kind of Epi analysis, so of course we've got to understand confounding and effect modification. And I just listed here a few things that could be confounding the, the trend itself. Um, and so obviously that could be um, the appearance or disappearance of programs or policies, um, introduction of new medical interventions, Changing in reporting definitions really gets important when you're doing uh, trend analysis because um, obviously if things aren't reported in the same way over time, we're going to have biased results. Demographic composition, um, in a different way, this is more, for example, at the aggregate level, um, we usually think about the, the usual demographic variables as potential confounders in an individual level data analysis. For trend data, think about as we do smaller geographic areas, and let's say we want to look at a trend in a city, or even if we can get down to a neighborhood level in a city, um, and we want to look at that over the past 20 years, well, in many places, including in my city, Chicago, the makeup of neighborhood A in 1999 is very different than the, make, the demographic makeup in that neighborhood today. So what are we really comparing across time then? And how, and how can we deal with those, those differences? Uh, reporting accuracy is another one. We've already kind of talked about that. And also just secular, secular issues. You know, what has changed if we really have the luxury of looking at 20 or 30 data points, what has changed in those 20, and 20 or 30 years that might be impacting the, the outcome that we're interested in or, or the services we're interested in, et cetera? No different than any other kind of analysis. It just is, you know, you just have to, things are just slightly altered in the way we think about them because we're looking at, at data over time. The smoothing techniques, especially when we're looking at doing trend analysis in smaller areas or with smaller populations, so smaller sample size, we need to think about smoothing because mostly we're going to look at trends, and you'll see pictures of this in a minute, where there's just a lot of fluctuation due to the small sam sample size. It's just random fluctuation. And in other words, the fluctuation as opposed to some smooth, easy to interpret um, line, you know, is something monotonically increasing or decreasing over time. So we think about different approaches for getting that smoothed effect so that we can interpret what we're seeing uh, better. 
One way is to use the natural log transformation of our outcome variables. Um, and it, the, the best example, I think, of this is if we think about rates decreasing over time, which in our world, um, you know, is usually what we want. Like if we're looking at adverse outcomes, we're, of course, hoping that rates are decreasing over time. And if you think of something like maternal mortality or infant mortality over time, what happens is when you think in a regression scenario and you try and smooth the data by drawing a line through the data, if you, don't, if you just use the raw data, eventually you're going to extrapolate out into the future and it's going to reach zero. And we know that no matter how great a healthcare system we hopefully will get to at some point in our lives, um, that we're not going to get to zero infant mortality or zero maternal mortality. By using the natural log transformation of those outcome variables, we will, by definition, never get to zero. So that's a kind of a smoothing technique that gives us a more realistic assessment of where we're heading. Often, and I know we all do this, we combine years of data to get some stability. Obviously, it's a way of gaining sample size at each data point. And we're going we're gonna to talk about different ways to combine those years of data. And there's weighted averages. There's actually unweighted averages. Um, and we have to understand what that means in terms of loss of information. And there's also moving or rolling averages where we do gain stability, gain that smoothing effect, but we're better able to preserve information, not, not lose too much. And then re regression techniques by definition are, are smoothing techniques. So I, I, I hope this slide is just repeating what you mostly know already, but I always find it useful to remind myself of, all of this again. When we think about um, combining years of data, what are the different ways that we can do that? So on the top, the first box, the unweighted average, we literally start with the, rate, the rates themselves. So, you know, infant mortality, 2013, its rate, plus the rate in 2014, plus the rate in 2015, and just divide by three. It's a simple average, you know? And in that case, what I've showed you, I said the weight is one over three, but it's unweighted. Basically, you haven't, you, there's no differentiating between weights for the first year, the second year, and the third year. In the second box that's shaded, that I, where it says weighted averages, you're, you're not starting with the rates themselves. You're starting with the numerators and denominators that make up those rates. And so in the, uh, in the, in the numerator, you're literally first summing the raw numerator for year one, numerator for year two. This is really, I would call this actually just creating the three-year rate. So instead of thinking of it as an an average of rate one, rate two, rate three, you're saying, I just want a combined rate, a three-year average. When, you, when you're doing that, it is actually a weighted average, and I've, I've given you this the formula here. So the weights are actually, for each rate, the weights are its denominator over the total. And, you know, I think you can, you get that, with net, like think about infant mortality in each state, the totals, the total number of births in each year actually doesn't vary that much. So there might not be much difference in the weights between denominator, you know, one, denominator two, denominator three. But technically, this is a way to count for any any variation there is over time. And so you can see that for these, um, you know, you do the process of either the, the unweighted or the weighted averages for each set of three years. And what that means is that instead of, um, you know, having 15 data points, you're ending up with five data points. So there is a loss of information there. One approach to avoiding that loss of information is to do 
still getting three-year averages, but to do it as rolling averages. And so here the idea is you just don't have mutually exclusive three-year rates. You have overlapping weighted three-year averages. And you can see here first you're doing years one through three, then you're doing years two through four. So in this second weighted average, years two and three have been both in the first weighted average and in there in the second weighted average. And you do that um, for all the, you know, you keep doing that till you get to the end of the series. Some people sometimes do things um, at the ends to really end up still even with 15 data points. I've shown it here with only getting 13 because, you know, at each, you don't quite, you have nothing to add at this end or this end. But, you know, th this is the general approach to doing it. So it's a very nice way of both smoothing, getting rid of those fluctu wild fluctuations, particularly if you have small sample size, and then, and, and still not keeping the same number of data points, or in the case of trend analysis, keeping a reasonable sample size for analyzing the shape of the trend. And then we can go on from those more descriptive approaches and use regression analysis, which is a smoothing technique. And there we're going to gain the stability, we're going to preserve the information, but the trade-off with regression analysis is we're going to lose the real data and we're going to end up with that regression line instead of looking at the observed data. And we'll talk about how we can try and get the best of all worlds here with all, with all of these techniques. Um, with the regression approaches, uh, uh, this is actually true. When I say this, this is actually true with the rolling averages as well. We have to now think about correlation. You know, like in the rolling averages, you're going to have correlation because some of the years that are in one of the averages are also in the, you know, it's not mutually exclusive. In the regression analysis, this is also true because remember, even just in, in trend data before it's moved, depending on what the uh, outcome variable is and who's in the numerator and who's in the denominator at each data point, you, those observations might not be independent and they might be correlated. In maternal and child health, this isn't quite as big a, an issue as it in, is in some fields because, for example, although some mothers might be in uh, multiple, you know, some over a 10-year period, there's going to be women that appear in your data set three times or four times because they've delivered four babies. But it's not that we're using population denominators where everybody's in the denominator every year. You know, if you're alive in, if you were alive in 2004, a huge proportion of us were also alive in 2005, 2006. And that's where you really get into some of the real statistical issues with correlated data, I don't think we need to worry about it too much in MCH. This is where if you're doing really serious time series analysis, um, this is where you would use those specialized, those specialized statistical procedures when you really think you are violating the independence assumption in the data that you have. But again, for most of the typical work that we do for surveillance and monitoring or even program evaluation, um, we don't have to resort to that. But you, you, it's something you need to have in the back of your head and think about and make sure you feel comfortable with the technique that you're using. And then also both parametric and non-parametric regression approaches are available. We will talk about that a little towards, towards the end. In any regression analysis, and, and let's be clear here, we're talking about linear regression approaches. Um, it's important to say this, you know, even when year, like in this example I've made, year is the independent variable here in this regression equation, but in any analysis, if that were 
age? Is that were uh, some, oh, you know, number of adverse childhood experiences that a person reported on the BRFAS data? In any linear regression analysis, those beta coefficients and the p-values associated with them are tests of linear trend. So it might not be trend in, it might not be time trend, but it's trend in something. Trend in number of aces or trend in some score on some other, um, some other you know, risk score that you've calculated for individuals. So the only difference here is that the independent variable now literally is a time variable, whether it's year or month or you know, whatever day, whatever is appropriate for your analysis. So what we get out of a regression model is a test for linear trend. I've done this model as um, a log linear model like we often do. So it's taking the natural log transformation of those rates that we're interested in. Other than that, it's just a regular regression equation. And what I've shown you at the bottom of the page is a way out of that regular regression uh, equation when it's time that we're looking at, we can get the annual percent change directly from that regression model. And we don't have to talk to this in de depth, but I wanted to give you so you could see how the calculation is done using the beta coefficients. And what's circled here, so I mean, you could just do this without thinking about the rest of those calculations when you're looking at whatever you know, SAS output or SPSS output or whatever standout, whatever you're using. This is a way doing 100 times the exponent exponentiation of that beta coefficient for year and then minus one actually gives you the annual percent change. And we're going to look at some examples of this too, but this is for your reference so that you know what kinds of things you can, you know, you can calculate by hand. I'm not sure if I show that here later on. You know, even if you're just using, you know, Excel to look at trend data, there are ways to, in a more brute force way, calculate annual percent change, but it's obviously much easier to do, in my opinion, out of, out of a regression equation. So regression analysis, unlike those other smoothing methods we've talked about, um, gives us a confidence band around the regression line itself as opposed to the separate confidence intervals that we can calculate around each data point. Um, and so this is, having the regression band is really more informative because it is looking at the trend line itself, the pattern over time itself, as opposed to with no mutuality, you know, no joint looking at the data points, just separately looking at each data point that makes up the trend. And those confidence bands, in addition, remind us that the reliability of our data is better when we do, in terms of the regression approach, closer to the center of the data than at each end of the data. Here's an example, and these are old data, but I still like the example. So these were, these, this is real, it's not made up data, it's just old, you can see it's 1980 to 1996, I was, luckily for me, got to help the state of Hawaii a little bit, which means I got to make a couple of trips there, um, which was fun and beautiful. Um, and so this is Maui County. So you, most of you, I, I assume, know I learned this back in when I was working with Hawaii. I don't think I knew that the islands are actually the counties you know, they're equivalent to the counties. So this is Maui County data. It's obviously there for pretty small sample size because this is um, infant mortality data. Um, and right on this graph, I've just plotted the individual confidence intervals around each of the data points. 
Um, and I'm asking you the question, and not rhetorically, does, does someone want to chime in on what do you think the meaning, or what, what are you looking at here, and what do you make of, obviously, the confidence intervals that are overlapping? Anybody? Somebody must want to say something. If anybody wants to say anything, press star seven. Okay. Boo. All right. Um, hopefully you'll say something soon. So, you know, to me, these confidence intervals are not that useful and people all too often misinterpret what, it, you know, they'll say, oh, the confidence intervals, you know, between 1995 and 1996 are overlapping. Therefore, there's no significant difference between those two points. So first of all, that is incorrect. The doing a formal statistical test handles the standard error of the estimates of each data point a little bit differently, and you really cannot if, let's put it this way. If there was no overlap between the two confidence intervals, for sure a statistical test would say those two points were statistically different. But if there is overlap between the confidence intervals, that does not automatically mean that's an insignificant result. And then if you extend that to the trend overall, just looking at the scatter plot of the data points for Maui County, just eyeballing it, it looks to me like there's a slight improvement, you know, a decrease over time in the infant mortality rates. And those confidence intervals really tell me nothing. I, I can't interpret. Is there a trend there or not? They're really not helping me understand that. So here's the regression line I kept the scatter plot so that you could see the real observed data, but now you can see the regression line, which is in yellow. This is the regression line here. And then you can see the confidence band around the regression line. So for example, in Maui, which was doing really well, let's look at this last data point. Let's see if I can do this here. And think about it in relationship to the year 2000 at that point objective. So, you know, the, the actual yellow point is the, is the observed data. When you look at the confidence band around that data point, and if you were to carry out, you know, extend, extrapolate even the upper bound of that confidence band, over to this, you know, year 2000 objective, right? They're, they're, they're still below it, right? If I, I'm trying to brute forcefully extrapolate that line. Um, so what, to me that says, wow, even as of 1996, Maui County, we can, with 95% confidence, we can say we think that Maui County has already surpassed the year 2000 objective for infant mortality. I, I don't want to imply that this, what you see on the slide here, is like necessarily the best way to present the data. In other words, depending on your audience, this is probably too busy. But for you as the analyst, even if you just present the, the scatter plot of the real observed data, and when you write the interpretation or speak the interpretation, if you're standing up in front of an audience, you having looked at the data presented as they are in this slide, it helps you be able to make statements that, are, that tell the whole story and uh, make the story richer and more meaningful. This is the same thing, except now I literally did using this was, I think I just did this in Excel, honestly. Um, and I 
fooled Excel to, um, in my Excel spreadsheet, I added the years 1997, 1998, 1999, 2000, and sort of dummied, um, um, just said that those years existed. I wish I could, I should actually find that spreadsheet. And so I, I got it to just extrapolate the lines out to the year 2000. So here again, you can see what we talked to, what we just talked about on the previous slide, that even over here at the end, you can see even the upper bound of this confidence interval is projected at the year 2000, obviously to be way below, um, meaning better than the year 2000 objective. Um, so we do need to think about when we want to, you know, not lose the observed data, which most audiences really want to see that observed data. Although I will say, um, even the Maui data, while there was ups and downs and fluctuations, it wasn't that hard to look at. Sometimes the raw data are hard to look at. So we as the analysts have to make the decision um, and this is, you know, a whole other thing we could talk about. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that in June when you were all together, you did a lot on data presentation. So, you know, thinking through wh what is going to make it easiest for an audience to understand the story is obviously another big job of ours. Um, but just to say, the observed data is, is really important to maintain if we can and to display if we, if we can. The, the other point here is that smoothing isn't always appropriate because sometimes it is the fluctuation itself that is telling the story. And particularly, and we will definitely see examples of this in a, in a minute or two, if the trend, you know, those even using regression analysis, remember it's linear regression. If the shape is not linear, you're going to smooth, you're going to mask what's going on. So why would you want to smooth away an important part of the story? So we're going to have to look at that and see when and under what circumstances smoothing should actually be used. And here's one example of this. These are, this is old data, but I just I can't give up this graph because I, I just like it a lot. So this was a, this is um, reported number of measles cases, measles cases 1980 to 1992. And I've asked the question, which is a rhetorical one, should the data be smoothed? Should a regression line be drawn? And so here's another question. What happened here? Why, why is this? such an outlier? Anybody know or remember? Take a guess. There was a measles epidemic um, in 1989. And so that's why there was, a, you know, this is an outbreak. This is a, 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 a there, there actually was something real going on there. It's not, this, there isn't an outlier because it's just small sample size. Um, this was something real. I've made this up essentially, but you can see the, what I'm guessing might be the regression line if, I, if we were to run a regression analysis through the data. And if you looked at that and hadn't looked at this at the raw data first, you would really say the wrong thing. You would say, well, the number of measles cases appear to be decreasing over time, over this whole 12-year uh, period, and you wouldn't say anything about something that was really important, which is that we had an actual measles epidemic in the late 1980s. Here's another example, um, which I can't, I don't know about you, but I'm compulsively looking at you know, information about how, how many people are now supporting single payer or not supporting single payer or whatever. So this is, this was um, from the Gallup poll 
Do you think it is the responsibility of the federal government to make sure all Americans have health care coverage, or is that not the responsibility of the federal government? Um, and so the top line is here, it is the responsibility, and the bottom line, it isn't the responsibility. I've, again, this is me, not Gallup poll, I've sort of made up what I think might, the regression line, if I drew a straight line through the data, might look something like those two lines, the dashed lines. So what do you think about that? And first of all, okay, look at this for a minute, and, and just somebody tell me what you see, not just should the data be, I do want you to answer, should the data be smooth or are the regression approaches useful, but what else do you see here? Because I see something so interesting in this graph. Star seven. Hello, this is Janice. Hi. Hi. Well, what I see, and I could be completely wrong, is right between 2006 and 2008, um, the two different percentages, the, the light gray and the dark gray, are pretty far apart. But then it was somewhere around that time that the ACA, um, I believe, came into being. And it seemed to sort of, I don't know, normalize them both. That's exactly what I see. When I saw this, I just kind of thought, well, I mean, first of all, thank you for that. First of all, why, I, I can't even figure out, I wonder why the top line, which is people that said, yes, it is, why that appears to be decreasing over time. It, it's so weird. It's like maybe people were just getting so frustrated or they were hopeless that the federal, even though they believed that the federal government had a responsibility, but they were hopeless about us ever doing anything. I don't know. So I don't, the, before 2008, I kind of, I, I actually don't understand that top line that well. I'd love to, you know, see if someone at the Gallup poll has an explanation. And then I totally agree with you. It was just, it, it was just um, my jaw dropped, you know, when I saw this starting in 2009 and then moving forward, kind of the merging of these lines in terms of the proportion of people that think it's the federal government's responsibility to provide health care. So whatever we think of the ACA, something happened with its introduction and its continued implementation. And then actually think about it's not fully implemented, as I'm saying this, till 2014. You know, what's happening there? We appear to have, interestingly, a strange little, I don't know what's going on in 2016. I mean, this is where now I'd like, I can't wait to see this, you know, out to 2018, 19, 20. So with the ACA, though, I mean, it is still interesting. We're a little bit under, you know, we're around 50%, right, of, of, of groups that think it's the federal government's responsibility um, to provide health insurance to everybody. I don't know. I thought this was fascinating. In a way, it's a beginning look at uh, program evaluation, if you want to think about it this way, you know, before the ACA and after the ACA, what kinds of things changed, okay? Um, okay, so we're going to go on then. That's just the brief overview part of this. Now we'll get into some more specifics. Before I do that, are there any questions or comments at this point? Okay, then let's go on. I, this I'm is sorry. John. I, oh, hi. Sorry, I had a question about um, the the Maui graph that you showed, um, mm -hmm. and I was just thinking about presenting that to an audience. And a lot of our um, a lot of your actual data points there are are outside of the confidence band itself. Um, and I was wondering if how how I guess how to explain that to an audience what what those confidence bands mean when there's 
sort of so many data points outside of it. You know what, though? This is, yeah. Two things. I'm really glad you pointed that out to me because I think what I did here, um, I, I want to make sure, you know what, I, I don't want to, first I was going to say I was worried as you were saying this that what I overlaid, but no, maybe this is right. Because remember to do the regression, I'm doing the natural log transform, but you can see by the the axis here, I uh, you know, got it back onto the, I, I exponentiated, you know, to get everything back on the right scale. And so I'm just wondering if that has something to do with this, to be honest with you. Um, but let's go back, but I think, no, I think I did this right. You know, you got me concerned here. But let's go back for a minute because I think what's happening here is the regression line. Let's look at, wait, let's pick a year that's outside. So, for example, let's look at 1998 because that's one of the years you're talking about, which is below the, the lower confidence bound. And let's go back, oops, sorry, to here. Okay, so here's. 1998. So remember that for each of the points themselves have a confidence interval around them. And if I, I think if we look back now to the regression line, let's see, we're up to, let's see, oh, it looks like about eight, right? Where the, the upper bound of this confidence interval, right, is at about eight. Would you say seven or eight, something like that? And so if we look to here now, back to 1998, did I ever, oh, I did, it took the, uh, this is the 1998. But here, the regression line, you know, the upper bound was eight, so like around here. So, the, you know, part of the confidence interval where we said that the point estimate might be is within the confidence band of the regression line. You're asking a different question, though. I can say this to you because you're the analyst, but in terms of if somebody in an audience, I mean, what it might mean is that you show two things. You show, um, you know, little multiples, you know, in the Tufty language, which maybe you heard about last June, where you have a repeat of this chart, you have one version that just has the regression line and a different chart next to it that has the observed data. I mean, that's, you know, you're asking a good question and it's about figuring out which display or maybe you only show the observed data and you only talk in narrative about the regression line. That's, you know, th those are, you're asking very valid questions. So I guess the long and the short of it is there's no definitive answer. Um, uh, it's obviously easier to talk to an audience like I'm talking to right now and going through the issues of confidence bands and confidence limits and exponentiation. For a more, for a lay audience, it's, you know, I'm not even sure for a lay audience, to be honest with you, that I would show the confidence bands. Maybe I would show the observed data and then the straight line being drawn through that data. And then, then it's a little easier because then you're just having to explain, well, of course, the straight line is an average through the data points. And so each data point is not going to fall directly on the regression line. The regression line is kind of averaging across all of those data points. That's the best I can do now. I hope that was at least somewhat useful. Anybody else before we go on? Okay. Um, so, of course, setting targets is something that, you know, all the Title V programs have to do. Um, and, um, the, the question is, 
how sort of conservative or challenging, how do we want to, how can we use trend data to make some, help us make decisions on what the targets could be? So we could set targets just based on let's continue what we've been doing, and if we do that, what's going to be the slope of the line moving forward? Or we can challenge ourselves and force the slope to accelerate and move faster towards an objective. What you're looking at here then is the difference, you know, here is just the direct extrapolation of this trend line. That's what, how we've been doing over time. But using that same trend line, and here, and we have our, let's say this is a goal that's five years out, we might say, what does it take, what would it take for the slope of the line to look like this? And remember, we can get average annual percent changes. And then we could look at each of the yearly points along that slope. And it will tell us what a target might be if, the, if, our, if we think we are really wanting to reach that long, longer term goal by the end of that five year period. And the other thing is we want to, may want to not just look at the crude rate over time, but we might want to do what we always do in EPI, which is stratify, and look at different subpopulations. The thick line here with the arrow pointing to it is that overall rate, the crude rate. And then the other lines are different groups. So we might think to ourselves, well, do we just want to set the target based on that? Or for example, we've got some groups that are this line, if you can see it, if you follow this line, it's actually, if anything, it's certainly not improving over time and maybe it's getting a little worse over time. Wouldn't we like to look at that trend and look at the group that's represented and reflected in that trend? and say, ooh, what's going on here? And maybe we want to focus, increase you know, our efforts more intensely for that group to try and get them on the same trajectory towards some longer term goal. And you know, the converse, obviously, this group, right, that slope is looking much more accelerated downward. And what does that mean? So we, we, we might want to really um, think about target setting not just for an overall rate, but think about it in, for different subgroups within the population. Another idea is to use the ten data, trend data to get projections, predicting the time at which each indicator is, it will meet or surpass one of those longer term goals, compare across indicators. So not the stratification is with one indicator. You know, take one indicator, look for different subgroups on that one indicator. Now this is saying, what if we want to look at lots, a bunch of indicators, I'm just looking at three here, and we want to look at the the, the way what the trends are telling us for meeting the longer term goals for each of those indicators, and then incorporate this into the priority setting process in the needs assessment, for example, to, in, in, this, in my little example, it would say maybe improving indicator one, you know, because it looks like indicator one, we're way farther off, we're not going to meet the objective, the longer term objective, till 2026. Indicator two and indicator three, we still have a ways to go, but we're going to meet them in uh, either you know two or four years' time. So this is another way to use trend data to help us think about targeting and think about priority setting, and therefore meaning what are the implications of that, how we allocate resources to various programs, to various subgroups within those programs, et cetera. These are just ideas of how we can use trend data to really help us. Um, 
So here, again, instead of with one indicator, as we looked at a few slides ago, this is with two, just indicator X and indicator Y. And we're looking at their, their trajectories over time, at the trend data over time, along with the long-term goals. And you know how should the targets be set? And maybe what this says is, maybe we're not, it's not a one-size-fits-all. We're not going to have one approach to target setting. Depending on what trend data shows us, we might set targets differently. So for indicator X, it looks, again, if we're assuming that decreasing is good, you know, we're reducing an adverse outcome, we're, we're doing pretty well here. We have what looks like a steady increase over time. And even if we just continue doing what we're doing, we're getting pretty close then over time to meeting our longer term goal. That's not the picture with indicator Y. We're actually at the beginning here, we're actually closer to the longer term goal than we are at the end. It looks like there's some deterioration in the rate in indicator Y. Anybody want to say one possibility um, as, a, as an example in, in the real world, in our world, in MCH, what indicator Y might be? How about low birth weight? And this may not be true. I actually didn't look up all the way through our most recent data, but you know there was a period um, where actually we weren't doing very well in reducing the low birth weight rate. And if anything, in some places and in some groups, it was actually on the rise. So um, in any case, this could be anything. I mean, I just drew these lines and made them up. But when I look at indicator Y, it kind of reminds me of low birth weight. Another way to think about this, and again, this is a lot you know, for, the, for the needs assessment, which should be ongoing, but certainly every five years. Um, and I, I, this is me. I tend to like tools like this, like a little grid um, that helps, you know, because especially for the needs assessment, we have so many, you know, it's not like we're doing an analysis of one indicator or even two or even five. You know, we've got dozens and dozens of indicators that we're looking at. And I need help summarizing all the data that I have and coming up with consistent ways that really help the Title V program in the decision making process. This is just one idea. So what you see here is a grid where the rows are um, based on the trend data. So is the trend improving? Has there been no change? Or is the trend deteriorating? And then the columns are related to some benchmark, some standard or goal. Have we, have we surpassed the goal already? Are we close to meeting the goal? Are we still far from the goal? And obviously, the best case scenario is trend data shows we're improving, we're still improving, and we've already surpassed the goal. And the worst case scenario is down here. We're doing worse over time, and boy, we're still far from the goal. But you, any of the, you know, and what I think I would do is then in each cell, you know, I would expand this and actually write the indicator names. And it's like, you know, so you might have only a couple of indicators in the improving and surpassed cell, and you might have only a few, hopefully, indicators in the worst case scenario. And then you're going to have a bunch of indicators in all the other cells. And again, it might, it's going to help you think through, OK, how should we set a target for each of those? You know, if you're in the middle cell, we haven't been, we're not changing over time. We're pretty close to the goal, but we're, really, we're not improving, though. So will we ever reach that goal? How do we want to handle the indicators in that cell? Any questions before we go on to program evaluation? <coughs> Excuse me. So for a program evaluation, 
it's this before and after um, concept. And, um, but there's all these scenarios. So it might be before and after for a single group. Everyone got the program, and we're going to look at that group, and do they improve over time? We might have two groups. Only one group got the program, so the idea of like a, a treatment group and a non-treatment group, and we want to compare those two groups. Or we might say both groups got the program, but are there group differences in terms of did the program work differentially for one group as opposed to the other? And the shape of the trends might be the same, or they might be different before and after, before and after the program. Okay. These are made up data and made up graphs just to, um, just for us to be able to discuss. So here's the idea that there was a program um, aimed at reducing infant mortality. Um, and it, the program was implemented in 1999. Only one group got the program. There looks like there's an improving trend. And I'm saying it doesn't look like there was, right, it does this slope from 1990 to 1998 look that different from that slope? I don't think so. I mean, I, I certainly don't think there would be a statistical difference there. We could argue over whether there looks like a little bit of a difference there. But basically, what, what does this say? It's like, well, yeah, there was a program, but we were sort of on this trajectory anyway. So did the program really have an impact? Here's the same group. There's an improving trend, but now it really does look like there might this might this does now look like a steeper slope after the program was implemented. So that's that's good news for us. Now we have two groups. They're parallel lines, so that's why it's the same trend over time. There is a difference in the slopes after 1999. But the difference applied to both groups. So first of all, do we think both groups got the program? Or is there a possibility only one group got the program? There was a secular change, something else, that wasn't the program per se, so that both groups improve over time, but it's not necessarily the program, even though it looks like it's, it occurs, that, that change in slope occurs right around program implementation, but, you know, is it really due to the program? So if both groups got the program, uh, we might say, yes, boy, that looks like there was a program effect. If only one group got the program and yet another group that didn't get it shows the same kind of really accelerated improvement over time, then it makes us question how much impact the program actually had. Here's another one. Two groups, diverging trends, possible change in the slope with the start of the program, at least in one group. So the disparity changes over time. It's obviously sort of non-existent there and bigger there. So who do we think got the program? Let's hope it's the people on the pink line got the program and that we really have affected with the program Everybody was on the same trajectory and even with the same starting point pretty much in 1990. And after the program, the, two, the rates for the two groups diverge, and hopefully it's because here this is the group that got the program. Same idea, diverging trends, although here they didn't start out together. Right? We have a big disparity at the beginning. At the end, we've almost, we've basically wiped out the disparity, and hopefully it's because this group on the top is the group that actually got the program, right? So, and they, we forced their trajectory with the program, I shouldn't say we forced, we enabled those rates to go down by implementing a program that works. And this group down here just kept on there uh, in the pink line. The trajectory remained the same over the whole time period. 
Same idea, again and again. You see, this is the way you have to think in your mind and what you want to look for, though, as you're doing, as you're using trend data to do program evaluation. Here we actually have a crossover, so what is this all about? The group on top actually now is better by here. You know, they were way worse way at the beginning, and now they're actually better than the, than the group that was better to begin with. Those graphs, if you now want to think about them uh, in regression uh, terminology and the idea of using regress regression modeling to test, to actually do formal hypothesis testing for program evaluation, so we're asking a bunch of que different questions. Was there an immediate change just after the program was implemented? Did the rates all of a sudden change? And that, in regression terms, that means did the intercept change? All of a sudden, did the beginning, it, you know, is the intercept different? Then we want to ask questions about the slope. Are the trends before and after the change parallel or the slopes different? So, you know, first we've got the beta coefficient for the intercept, and then we've got a beta coefficient that re represents the slope, that either the variable was year or month or day or whatever our time variable was. And then we can also ask, did both things happen? There was an immediate change and there was a, a change in the slope, the, ch the shape of the trend um, after the program. And of course, in regression, we can control for a bunch of covariates, so we can analyze whether all these questions are answered the same or differently for different groups. And this is the way just in, you know, simple pictures what it would, what it would look like. So the picture one is the slopes of the lines don't change, but the program did something immediately. Like we, we reduced immediately something that happened. Um, and then, the, but, but then uh, the, the rate of change after the, after the immediate drop is the same as it was before. Picture two is the intercept stayed the same, but the slope changed, right? So you can see the inflection point right there, right? So the intercept, there wasn't any huge break like there is there, but then the trajectory downward has changed. And then three is both of those. There's both an immediate effect of the program and then continued improvement across time. Um, we're going to look at some examples with regression and efforts, but are there any sort of technical, mechanical, or even conceptual questions now before I, we move into quality improvement? Okay. The data here are different, and you know this is a fairly. It's really only been in the past five years or so, I would say, that MCH has gotten so involved in the quality improvement world, and and you know doing a lot with um, you know ho hospitals, you know, and looking at perinatal outcomes and that that sort of thing. Um, so I would say I'm still a novice in this myself. So I'm just sharing with you what I so far, um, I, I should say I do, I have worked as a, uh, the data lead and data consultant for our, the Illinois Perinatal Quality Collaborative. Um, so I've you know, had the opportunity to work with data like this, but I still think there's a lot of unanswered questions here for us as epidemiologists. Um, in any case, here we've got data, we've got ongoing data collection, right? It's not like we're getting the vital records file or something. We're, we're trying to look at data in real time and as it's being collected, and as it's being collected, it's being accessed and displayed. The time intervals are short, so now we're usually not talking about annual data. We're talking about days, months, quarters, maybe even hours, depending on the outcome. The Sample sizes are really small. It's not even like small area analysis. You're looking at you know, data from a, from a NICU in a hospital or something like that, really small sample sizes. 
often not comparison groups, just looking at those, um, you know, um, women, babies, children who are being treated. Typically, no formal statistical testing, and typically focusing on processes, not on outcomes, although there increasingly, I think, is a focus on, on outcomes. But it's, it, it is a little different than uh, what we're used to in other kinds of analysis. And in the QI world, we have these things called run charts and control charts. The word run refers to the consistency in points. Um, usually, we're sort of rule of thumb saying at least five um, that are above or below an average. So we, we see a monotonically increasing or decreasing trend. And then the, the control chart simply just adds essentially like confidence intervals around the process being measured. It, it usually is you know, looking at a standard deviation or maybe an interquartile range, something that looks at, puts some kind of bracketing around the actual observed data points in the, in the um, chart. So here is, and I've given you the source here too, but here's, I, I think these are nice um, examples of where what you'd like to see in, in a QI study where you started out with points all above this line and over time now you've got everybody below this line consistently. So even though there's fluctuation up and down here, but once we get to, I guess, this point right here, they're all below the line. So we've got at least one, two, three, four, five, six, like seven below the line. So we would call that a run. And similarly, at the top left, that's a run. Um, here in, in for what they call rule number two, again, thinking about how many points do we need, and we've got some different stuff going up here, right? We've got an increasing trend here. We've got sort of a leveling off there. And we've got a drop there. And so we would look at this in terms of, um, you know, what are the processes going on? What's, what's being done clinically? Um, and so then how do, we, how do we interpret that data? And then this one in Rule 3 is just there, there's, there's not, you know, we see a consistent trend, but we, re we really don't, you know, see enough to call something an actual change or a, or a run. We just don't have, you know, it just means maybe we have to collect more data before we can make a statement about what's going on in the third one. And in the fourth one, we have kind of like my measles graph where we have some outlier and, and you know, what does that mean? How do, we, how do we interpret that? This is often what we're looking at. This, these didn't even put any control boundaries on these, you know, but again, we're really observing what's going on here, knowing what's going on um, in whatever clinical setting, typically it's in a clinical setting, what's going on, what processes were changed or not changed, who are the providers making those changes, et cetera, et cetera. Here's some examples um, just from the real world and from our world. So um, this is from Minnesota, and this is WIC data. And this was looking at missed appointments. So you can see it's the, the no-show rate. And what do we think? You know, does this look like um, the no-show rate has decreased over time? Let's say if we start from here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have eight data points. Post that, we have a lot of fluctuation over here. If you think about doing the more typical, you know, a, a parametric data analysis again, if you drew a line through these data, I bet it would show a trend. Um, but this, this, this is real data, and this is how it was presented. And you can see it's on the x-axis. It's months, um, and it's so from October 2006 
through January 08. So it's, you know, it's a decent number of data points. This is Florida. This is, if you all remember, whoever was involved with the reduction of non-medically indicated delivery, so less than 30, 39 weeks gestation by delivery type. For six hospitals, this is 2011 data, and what I really like about this graph, which is why I wanted to show it to you, is again, without, I don't think this is too busy of a presentation, and I think it, it packed a lot of information into one graph, so it's months, it's one year of data, it's got by the delivery type, so these are the C-sections, the inductions, Right, and then those combined and using the bars. So all deliveries, and then, you know, where was there, and, and it looks like, right, that the C-section, this trend line looks like this is where the improvement was happening. So I, I really like this graph. I don't know what you think about it, but I, I thought this was a great, great graph. Out of a quality improvement project. And um, here is a graph of also about uh, early elective deliveries. This one is Ohio. And here you can see how they chose, back to our discussion, so here they've looked at by private insurance or Medicaid, and they've plotted the observed crazy lots of fluctuation data along with a smooth line. So I liked this a lot too. You know, I think we're all learning how to do a better job of this, of you know, being able to tell a story, not, have, not overwhelm our audience with a lot of busyness, but really have rich data in, in what we present. Here's something very simple that we did here in, in Illinois. So this was also the non-medical deliveries data, but we produced for each hospital, um, and again, here we only had three years of data at this point, so small, sample size in that sense, but we looked at the state overall. Here we have perinatal re regionalization, so we looked at the perinatal network that each hospital was in, and then we looked at each hospital. So here we produced this for all 102 birthing hospitals in the state so that they were able to look at trend data for their hospital compared to the perinatal network they're in, and then, and then for um, Illinois, I'm sorry, this is the hospital is up here. The dashed line is Illinois overall. And then the slightly lighter gray line is for the perinatal network that this particular hospital was a part of. So they're actually in relate, they've gotten by the end of this time period, they're actually one of the better hospitals in their perinatal network and they're almost to the state, the state average. Um, so, you know, what can we do? I used to, at the beginning when I was starting to work with QI stuff, as an epidemiologist and a statistician, I was kind of, you know, frustrated, I guess is the right word, because of course I want to be able to deal with confounding and interaction and stratification, et cetera, and that is really hard when we have small sample size. So, but I think it's important to talk about it and think about what ways might we want to stratify even QI data that would be an, an obvious one is to maybe stratify by race ethnicity sometimes to make sure that there's not, you know, if there's disparities in clinical care, we also want to understand what's happening to the disparities over time or with introduction of new processes or anything. So. Um, I don't want to fully drop all of my epi training just because I'm in the QI world. Um, and that includes also maybe thinking about some comparison groups, doing some more formal studies, you know, maybe doing a little case control study with clinical cases and other people who don't have that, the outcome, et cetera. Thinking about what are in, in the measures that we're measuring, making sure that when you're working with clinicians that you know, you're not just taking things for granted. You're thinking about, okay, what is this indicator we're looking at and is that really the most appropriate indicator? And obviously sample size. And also if the outcomes themselves are very rare, like death, for example, 
thinking through intermediate outcomes, not just saying all we can look at is process data and never look at outcome data. Um, so I wanted to stop here, and Maureen, you can help me for a minute um, because I okay. can see how late we are. Because do I literally only have like about another 10 minutes? Um, well, technically six. Okay, six, whatever. <laughs> I, I think what I'm going to do, unless somebody in the audience uh, objects, I'm actually going to skip this section on regression approaches because they're a little harder. And you guys all have the slides. And by the way, feel free to email me, call me, whatever. You know, contact me if you are doing trend analysis and you have questions about this. And there's lots of good examples in here. But I think it might be a better use of our six minutes. This is showing you how to use joint point regression. Again, I'm not sure how many of you have done that and giving you examples of that. And then this is actually, low S is actually an even more, we're realistically, most of us aren't going to use low S in our real work. So I think that I wanted you to see it because um, use it. And I'd like to try and walk through the Dane County example because um, this is real and many of you may have heard something about this at one point in time. And we'll just do this pretty fast. If I go over by a couple minutes, so be it, I hope. Um, so this was an example. If you remember from about eight years ago, there was a huge national story about Dane County. Dane County is where Madison is in Wisconsin. And it started looking as though they had really tackled black, the black-white disparity in infant mortality. And so they started analyzing it. But I mean, this got national attention. So I just wanted to show you the, the kinds of things that they did. We don't have a lot of time to talk about it. So th this first graph, this is by race ethnicity. And they used, as a start, three-year rolling averages. So they did use a smoothing technique. And you can see what's happening, what the trends look like here by race ethnicity. This is actually using, they actually, in Dane County, Wisconsin, they use, this is LOS, which is the locally weighted polynomial regression as a smoothing technique. And you can see what they, they, they saw this unbelievable decline in the black infant mortality rate that they really thought was real. Okay, and that was using a smoothing technique in regression analysis. Then after that, there was the CDC was working with them, and they really began to say, well, what if we really have decreased the dis or even eliminated the disparity, what's it about? How did we do that? And they had a hypothesis about it being extremely premature African-American births. So this is a look, and this is using joint point regression where it appears that there ha was really a precipitous, very fast-paced, very accelerated decrease um, in extremely premature African-American births. So that was helping them trying to figure out why was this was happening. And then each year I up updated this. OK, so now in 2010, it says, Health officials puzzled by the mixed picture say they will investigate every infant death and hope to expand home visits to pregnant women. And Schlenker, this guy that was one of the main um, people, uh, a physician, I believe, um, looking at these data, said the county's racial gap has returned with three times as many black babies dying before their first birthdays as white babies, a chasm that had vanished from 2003 to 2007. This is Remember, this is 2010, though. It's not as simplistic anymore, Schlenker said. This has become very complex. M my attitude on that is, yes, it has. It is very complex. By the way, I'm not, this is, I think the work that these folks did is fabulous. I think this is the real world. So I am not at all having any kind of a critique here. It's a great example of using trend data to figure stuff out. So here's just some more quotes about, you know, 
you know, he's saying he still thinks it's real, but that something else has happened. And how do we now continue to use trend data to figure out what's been happening? And in 2011, they were still looking. They were looking at three-year averages again, um, and they were still seeing a big gap. So after that diminished gap, all of a sudden the gap returns. And I put in all the sources here, so you can go read these full arguments. So what they decided to do, I mean, this really was the trend data spurred action, which is what we are always hoping it will. So they really, they, they set up a, a femur committee, um, and they've, they, I know they have set up a safe sleep campaign like many states have and many counties have, and they're doing a lot more with home visiting. So they really were taking, taking this seriously. So here the safe sleep campaign was launched this is in 2014. So you can read that article. So we're moving through time here. Um, and now, we're, you know, they've got data about, because they've got femur going, you know, what deaths were sudden or unexpected, what, what, what was, were they related to co-sleeping or not. They're doing more in-depth analysis and more case review, which is really, really good. And then here, now through 2012, they've redone regression analyses, and they've tried to look at um, the graph on the left is infant mortality, graph on the right is preterm birth, which was their hypothesis, right about, and it is true. So look here at preterm birth, it does look that the, at, as though the black trend line for preterm birth is steeper than the other two lines. So that would explain some why, you know, the disparity would have improved because they were doing a better job of reducing preterm births to black women. But look at this over here. Now look at this is, again, obviously no linear trend analysis would show this line, right? They're able to show this curvilinear line and you can see the steep drop there and then it's on the rise again there. And this is the last, last slide. I actually grabbed this like a week ago or something like that because, again, I'm, I'm following this story. And I also think, well, well, let's just, so this says, Dane County's black infant mortality rate continues to be nearly three times the rate for whites. Despite in, infant death investigations, a safe sleep campaign, and home visits to pregnant women and new mothers, Health officials say the disparity is troubling because the county seemed to have eliminated the black-white gap a decade ago, which gained national attention as an apparent success story. One thing I just want to leave you with, here's trend data that's shown in a bar graph, not a line graph. So uh, back to presentation issues, why do you, uh, you know, I, I like, the, I think this is fine. It's sort of interesting to me and a, a point of discussion as to why they decided on a bar graph, not a line graph. And what they're showing here is, and I, I think this may be, maybe they wanted to show the black-white disparity year by year, which is, is, you know, it's easier to look at that to that than, and then, you know, this to this, looking at it in bars rather than a line. I think we could discuss that. You know, one other thing to think about always with bar charts is it also might have been effective to show instead of having it go white, black, uh, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, to have the series of points for blacks as all next to each other put the, you know, all the blue bars, make them contiguous, all of these bars, and then have all the yellow, I guess it is, bars contiguous, because then you would watch the shape of the trend in both blacks and whites. I think they chose this way because their focus was specifically on the black-white disparity. So I, the Dane County example is just a fabulous example of good epidemiologic work um, done in a small area with small sample size using highly, every, everything from 
more typical surveillance techniques and looking at observed trends to highly sophisticated regression approaches, but using trend data and as you collect more data, as the years go on, the shape of the trend keeps changing and you don't, it's not something fixed. You're looking over time and with each data point, you're getting more and more information that's hopefully spurring you to action and then maybe doing program evaluation after, you know, I haven't seen them yet, let's say, evaluate their safe sleep program. So anyway, I love this example. I think these folks are doing fabulous work. And we'll leave it there. And again, please um, thank you for your attention. And please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And, um, and I'll say goodbye. Okay. Thanks, Deb. And thank you, everyone, for participating um, in this webinar and actually over the whole 2017 training course. Um, as a reminder, we do record all of these webinars and archive them, and the link will be coming within the next day um, after the close of the webinar. <laughs> and remember, please, to complete the formal evaluation using the SurveyMonkey link provided. One last reminder. Um, if you haven't completed the one year out post training survey or the post webinar um, number one with Dr. Ocampo, please complete those as soon as possible. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me at City Match. Um, thanks again, everybody, for your commitment to this year. Thanks, Deb, for closing it out in such a fabulous way. And I hope you all have a great rest of 2017. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs>